In this episode, neuroscience professor Dr. Sergio Pellis takes on a journey through the fields of play. In the decades since the end of the Second World War, the opportunity for children to engage freely in play has gradually declined. Over the same decades, the prevalence of psychopathology has increased. Dr. Pellis will examine the overt reasons why and explore any correlations. <coughs> okay, th thank you, um, Craig, and thanks, Catherine, and the other organizers that invited me to be here tonight. And thank you all for turning up. It's a nice crowd. By the end of my talk, I'll have you all roughhousing with each other. <laughs> so be ready. <coughs> so I started studying play as a young graduate student who needed to find a project that I could do in four years. And I started by looking at Australian magpies, which look very similar to the magpies we have here, but th th for some various reasons, they're a little bit more interesting, one of which is they do rough housing play. And <coughs> I asked my prospective supervisor, well, why the hell are they doing that? And he said, well, this is 1975. He said, well, no one knows. And I thought, well, four years, I'll tell you why. <laughs> well, 44 years later, here I am, getting close to retirement and probably still won't have that answer, but, <laughs> but I have learned a few things along the way. And at the time, when I started looking at magpies, I would not have predicted the paths that that initial study would take me through both in geographical space and in terms of the kinds of things I had to learn in order to explore the phenomenon, the kinds of animals I would use. And what I'm going to do tonight is just give you a very sort of the, the tail end. After about 34 years, the last 10 years have sort of led me to a path that go, oh, damn, I've actually done something which may be interesting to other people other than to other people around the world to study play. <laughs> so I'll let you judge that tonight. So if we start with play, <coughs> just recently I was in Vienna and visited the, a museum and there was this beautiful painting by Peter Bruegel, 1560. And in it he has a diorama of 250 kids playing 83 different kinds of games. Now, there's several things to notice about this. First of all, they're all outside. And if you can detect anybody playing there, you'll see that there's no adult supervision. This is classic free play, outdoor play by children. And so why, why is this interesting? Because when I grew up in the 50s and early 60s, my experience was this. I played out there like these kids. As I've watched over the years, the decades, I've seen nieces and nephews, great nieces and great nephews grow up, and I look at their life and go, hang on, your life is very different to what I experienced. What the hell's happened? And when you look at the literature, what you find is that the, the impressions that something has changed is actually correct. So many studies have shown that since the 1950s, the incidence of, of play fr that's freely engaged outdoor without supervision by children has declined. And just to give you one little example, because there's thousands of studies, so I'll just give you a few highlights today. <coughs> in a study done in the early 2000s, the researchers went out and asked a, a bunch of mums with young, young kids, you know, did you play outdoor by yourself when you were a kid? And 70% of them said, yes, we did. And what about your children? How many do? Well, you can see that the numbers dropped considerably. This is 2004 this was published. It's even worse. So every, everything I'm showing you now is outdated because the trends that I'm showing you have gotten worse over the subsequent decades. So, the question obviously becomes, well, who cares? So, so they don't play. Well, they should be indoors doing something bloody useful, like doing homework. That's much better for them. But a few people have noticed that along with 
the decline in play, there's been a corresponding other change in the lives of children. And that is that over the same time period, the incidence of psychopathologies amongst children and adolescents have increased. And again, just to give you a brief flavour of the kinds of data I'm talking about, here's um, a study that was put together by Peter Gray, who scoured the literature and found studies done in 1948, this USA data, 1948 using a standard set of questionnaires that were then used, the same questionnaires were used 40 years later. And <coughs> this is the kind of question. You ask an adolescent and, this, and, and the, you're looking at how many of them agree with the answer. So I wake up fresh and rested most mornings. 1948, nearly 75% said yes. 1989, only 31% said yes. And as you work your way down this list, you can see that every indicator is going in the worst direction. One of the worst ones is, life is a strain for me much of the time. Nine, nine to 10% of kids said yes back in 1948. 35% of kids said yes in 1989. So things are getting worse. And of course, some of the social scientists in the room will go, yeah, but you know, these are questionnaires and things have changed. Maybe people are just, kids are more willing to tell you that they feel rotten. Maybe in 48, there was still this stiff upper lip kind of attitude, so they don't tell you they feel rotten. But if you look at other objective criteria, like the incidence of self-mutilation or suicide, they've gone up correspondingly too. So I think that these kinds of data truly reflect a change over the last 50 years in the kinds of lives the children are living. So we have this, axis, this graph that looks like this. Plays decreasing, psychopathology is increasing. Seems to be a correlation. But what we don't know, of course, is, is this a causal relationship? It may just be that there's other things going on on the planet in society that these two things happen to coincide. So in order to determine whether there is a causal relationship here, we have to try to do some experimental work. And what I'm going to talk to you about for the rest of the evening is a particular kind of play, rough and tumble play or play fighting, and there's several reasons for this. One reason is that it's a social activity and one thing you can be sort of sure of, people are hyper-social and so things that you do socially should be important. The next reason is that in rough and tumble play, you really push your social skills to the limits because there's a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity and things that you have to interpret about what your friends are doing with you. So for example, here's a little video clip for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the kid that just got kicked and knocked to the ground, he's got to say, hang on, what's going on here? What, what's Fred doing? You know, he's just, just having fun or is he taking advantage of me? Do I want to play with him again? All those things, you have to use your social skills to read the situation and know how to appropriately respond to your friend and any potential future invitations to play from that friend. The other reason that I'm focusing on rough and tumble play is that it's a pretty historically persistent form of play that you see across a wide variety of cultures. So for example, if you go back to that Bruegel painting, there is a little portion of that painting where he has two little kids down there engaging in clear rough and tumble play. They're wrestling with one another. This is 1560. 400 years later, in the 1970s, here are two kids rough and tumbling, rough, doing rough and tumble play. So it is a persistent problem. It's very common in, in children if they're allowed to engage in it. And finally, 
for me, who comes at this not from the point of view of somebody that studies people, but somebody that studies non-human animals, what's really useful to me is that it's also a prevalent phenomenon, form of play that you see in non-human animals. So, for example, here two chakma baboons from South Africa are getting ready to grab one another and wrestle. So, for all these reasons, this is good. But do we have a starting point? And there is a starting point in that there are some studies with children that point to there is a relationship between kids engaging in this kind of rough and tumble play fighting behavior and their social skills. And the work I'm reporting is mostly from a researcher from the United States, a guy called Anthony Pellegrini, who spent his whole career studying playing kids. And one of the first things he reported, which is very important because when you see things like two kids wrestling each other to the ground, you go, oh my God, they're going to kill each other, it's a fight. And what Pellegrini first found is that there is no correlation between kids who engage in rough and tumble play and engage in, in serious aggression. So if I, can't, if I am the sort that's going to come and wrestle with you, I'm not likely to be the sort that's going to turn around and punch Jeffrey in the face for real, right? It's just not correlated. So that means aggression and, and play fighting are two distinct things. The second thing that Pellegrini showed is that, and mostly in boys, because it tends to be more common in boys, boys, boys that are more likely to engage in rough and tumble play are the boys that other boys like, right? So that means there's something about me as someone who likes to engage you in, in rough housing that makes you like me, that, which is terrific. By the end of the evening, you may all hate me, but <laughs> hopefully that won't happen. Okay, and then the final piece of evidence that sort of really comes to roost on the central issue that we're dealing with this evening is that boys who engage in, in lots of this roughhousing play have also a greater capacity to use a variety of skills in order to figure out how to solve a social problem. So for example, I'll use you if you don't mind. Let's say, what's your name? Andra. Andra. If Andrew's got this glass here and it's got something that I really like, I want to convince her to share it with me, right? What's my repertoire? Well, one, one repertoire is just to deck her out and take the glass. <laughs> but, you know, that, that strategy may only work rarely because somebody else, give, look at me, somebody else might deck me out before I have a chance. Another strategy would be, you know, look, I know you like it, but if you give me a little bit, you know, next time I have something you like, you know, we, we negotiate. So what he found was the kids that do a lot of roughhousing have a greater repertoire of strategies to negotiate situations with peers. But the problem with all this, and you can see what I'm, where I'm getting at, what he's showing is that there are these correlations. When this happens, this is likely to happen. But what we don't know is, does this cause that? And the most important issue here is, does engaging in this roughhousing play cause an improvement in social skills? Well, we have to put that to an experimental test. And the problem is, for various reasons, some good, maybe some not so good, you just can't do it with human children. Like most of you, once you see the kinds of things I do to my animals, most of you would not volunteer your children for the experiments. <laughs> so, well, what do you do? Well, this is where this animal called the laboratory rat is sort of the bread and butter animal for behavioral neuroscience because you can do laboratory experiments, neural manipulations with a rat that you just cannot do with people. And fortunately for me, the rat plays a lot. And let me show you what they look like when they play. These are two young males around 35 days of age, which is their peak juvenile period. And this is what they do.
And if you give these animals a period of a short period of social isolation for a few hours, then you put them back together, they'll just keep doing this until they exhaust themselves and go to sleep, right? They love it. And hopefully, I've got a few students here that work in my laboratory, they seem to be, it's a fun enough thing to watch to enable my students to spend endless hours scoring the videotapes, <laughs> which is a very important part of the, the, the data collecting process. But let me just walk you through what one of these interactions look like. So if we start on your top left-hand side, A, B, C, D, E, F, etc., what you see is you have, at panel A, you have one animal approaching the other from the rear, reaching up to try to touch the back of the nape of the neck, and the one that's approached turns around and blocks access to, its, to the nape, and the one that's trying to get access continues pushing, and the other one ends up being rolling over on his back to defend his, his neck so that you can see by uh, panel H, the animal's lying, his neck pressed against the ground like, you're not going to touch it now, guy. <laughs> and the other animal's on top trying to get there. And then you can see that in the next panel I, the one on the bottom now lunges up and tries to get at the other one's nape. <laughs> and the other one uses its foot to push him down. And this goes on and on. Meanwhile, the the guy on the bottom, and these are guys as well, the 35-day-old males, the guy on the bottom, you can see by panel 8, eight um, L, he's starting to push with his hind feet. By M, he's pushed him off. Then the one that was attacked gets up, and you can see that the last panel here, you've got a, a reversal of roles. And this is what they're doing. They're interacting, trying to get at each other's napes, and if you're a rat, and you can touch your friend's nape, nuzzle your nose into that nape, you run away really happy with yourself. <laughs> and we know they're happy now because we've started recording what they say, and they use ultrasonic sounds, and when they succeed in doing this, they chirp away these happy little calls. And this behavior is most frequent in the peak juvenile period, which is around 30 to 40 days after birth. Now, what you can do is you can get these animals at that age and isolate them so that they don't get to interact with their peers for, for that time period. And so the standard kind of way that people did this back in the 50s, 60s and 70s was to do something like this. You wean the rats and then you put them in these little isolated cages and you let them grow there by themselves for about 20 days. And then you compare what their behavior and brains look like compared to animals that spent those same period of time living in this kind of environment. You've got lots of buddies. In this case, you've got a bigger cage. There's lots of things to climb, lots of things to manipulate. There's lots of opportunity for play here. And <coughs> what was found, and again, this was done by several decades worth of research by laboratories across the world, and what was found was that the lack of this juvenile play opportunity to engage in juvenile peer-peer -peer play leads to a series of deficits. So you show impoverished cognitive skills, reduced ability to re regulate your emotions, your short-term memory isn't as good, your ability to control your impulses aren't so great, and we all know that for good social interactions, you know, if somebody insults you, you probably want to wait a few seconds before you respond to really decide, really, what should be my response. And rats have got the same problem. They interact. One animal does something, the other animal reacts, and you can get an explosion that you don't want. And most importantly, social skills are compromised. Now, interestingly, all these patterns of, of psychological performance are all related to something that's called executive function. And executive function is essentially unbombarded by information. Now, I have to relate that information to things that I remember from my past. What was the emotional weighting in the past? What's the emotional weighting now? What are my options now? I've got to somehow synthesize all that and decide, well, what do I do? It's like I can only do one thing at a time. Out of all these options, I've got to choose something. And that's the role of executive functions. And it looks like that 
play has an influence on the development of these executive functions. But some of the most more astute amongst you may have noticed that in that experimental design I showed you was the equivalent of putting a prisoner in solitary confinement for several years. And we all know that solitary confinement is one of the worst punishments you can give to anybody. It's a surefire way to erode their mental health and their physical health. So maybe it's not the play that was the problem, but it was that they just socially isolated completely for 20 days, which is like a couple of years for humans, and this is having all these terrible effects. Well, one of the researchers that contributed heavily to that line of research back in the 70s, she realized this as well, and she came up with a solution. So this is Dorothy Iron, and she, she worked at the University College of London. And what she did was, she, she and her, co her students, they looked at litters of rats and simply asked the question, well, how, how much time in a day does a rat spend playing, a juvenile rat? And the number came out to about one hour out of 24 was spent playing in a laboratory setting. Okay? And so she said, okay, so if we isolate a rat completely and we have a rat that grows up with a peer, we know that the cognitive function of the isolate rat when he's older is worse. So what if we do the following experiment? We isolate a rat, but then every day give him or her a peer to interact with. But in one condition, we give them a peer who's normal, just like themselves. That's this condition on your left. And then the other one, you have a, a, an isolated rat, but you give them a peer who's given a drug that makes them just not interested in playing. They're still walking around, exploring the cage, but when the other animal tries to engage in play, they just ignore them. And what she found was, and she looked at various cognitive tasks, what she found was that just being given a normal peer for one hour a day, where most of the time is spent playing, results in normal cognition when they're young adults. The other animal, even though they're given another rat, but it's not playing with them, they're, they're deficient in their cognitive performance as badly as rats that were completely and utterly isolated. So we can from this assume that at least a good chunk of the deficiencies we see in these isolated rats is because of lack of opportunity to interact with a peer playfully. So the next thing that we did, and I just told you the story that led to my first 30 years of my career. This is what happened 10 years ago. We, we, we thought, well, okay, if, if executive functions are what is deficient in rats that have been prevented from playing with peers during the juvenile period, then the underlying neurology that supports executive functions should be changed by the, that experience. And that area is what's known as the prefrontal cortex. For, no, for those of you who've never seen a rat brain, here's one. It's exactly like your brain, nearly. It's got all the same parts. This big, big front area to your left, if you open up your skull, that would be the big gray matter you see. As you work your way to the back, you see that other lumpy cauliflower looking thing, that's the cerebellum and that's mostly associated with motor control. And then that little bit that's sticking out to the end, that's what connects the brain to the spinal cord. Now, the, the only difference between you and this rat brain is if we open up your skull, this front part, which looks fairly smooth, you just see some little lines in there. If we look at your brain, or my brain, what you would see is a lot more convolutions. What it means is for the space occupied by the brain, more convolutions mean there's more more room to pack more cells in. So essentially, our brains look exactly the same, except we've got way more cells. But functionally and organizationally, they're similar. So if we go right to the front here, on, this, on, on your left side, that's where the prefrontal cortex is. And 
the prefrontal cortex, if you destroy it, you d destroy the animal's executive functions. M many of you, I, I've had two, two parents who went this way, if they have little strokes and so on in that prefrontal cortical area, which is fairly common as, as you get older, you lose a whole lot of those skills that I mentioned, all these executive function skills, your impulse control diminishes, your short-term memory goes, and so on. <coughs> so what we can do is we can look at the prefrontal cortex. And if we cut the brain here, you, you would see two bits like on this side that look exactly the same because you've got two lobes. So I'm just showing you one lobe. And fortunately for me, one of the things that made this whole series of studies possible is that a couple of doors down, there was a colleague who has spent his life studying the prefrontal cortex, a guy called Brian Kolb. And so if I want to look at the frontal, prefrontal cortex, who do I go to? I go, Brian, what do you think of this as an idea? And if he says, yeah, that sounds like a reasonable idea, then you go, well, how can we actually do it? And he's got the wherewithal to, act, to do this. And what we know from Brian's work and a whole bunch of other studies done on human patients, monkeys, cats, dogs, you name it, is that these two areas that I've noted here, the pink one is an area called the medial prefrontal cortex, which is, you would see it where the two lobes meet in the front here, so it'd be down here, and the orbital frontal cortex, which in the rat, because the eyes are on the side, would be here, but in us, it'd be just sitting above our eye socket, okay? And these two areas are important because from what Brian told me, from his understanding of the, of the prefrontal cortex, these are the two areas that are most strongly implicated with social skills, okay? So, Terrific. So we're going to look at these two areas of the brain. How are we going to look at them? Well, we want to have rats that have not had play and rats that have had play and then see if these areas of the prefrontal cortex are different. How are you going to do that? Well, you see that sort of black squiggly thing that is on the panel next to that brain outline? That's the functional unit of the brain. It's a neuron. It's a brain cell. And what you see is right in the middle, there's that black dot right there. <laughs> I, I envy your height sometimes. But when you're traveling on short haul flights, I don't. <laughs> and <coughs> radiating from that, that central dot, which is the cell body, which is where all the juicy cytoplasm stuff that keeps the cell alive is, you have these projections going up and downwards. And these are called dendrites. And what you can see is that those dendrites also have branches. And then if you go to the furthest panel, you'll see those little, just two little bits of dendrite cl looking closer up, and you see that they've got these little knobs on them. They're called spines. And those are the spines where you make connections with other neurons. So essentially, this cell has got all this capacity to interact with millions of other cells. Okay. And so one way we can measure the effect of an experience is to see if the complexity of that cell has changed with the experience. So now we need to design an experiment. Now remember I showed you Einan's experiment back in 1978. We wanted to use Einan's paradigm. But one of the things that have changed since 1978 is that, yes, you can do lots of things with rats, but some of the things you can do with rats in 1978, you're not allowed to do in 19, uh, two, 2008, which is when we did our first one of these. And that is, in order to do what she did, she had to get a partner in, th in that experimental condition where you inject them with this drug every day. And if you ever try to inject a rat, if the first time they don't know it's coming, they don't complain too much, the second time they're anticipating this, they're getting annoyed. When you're doing this for 20 days in a row, good luck injecting that rat. And then it's so stressed out of its mind that it sort of changes the kind of experience it's giving the other rat. So that's a bad one. 
we tried to sell it to our animal welfare committee, but they said, no way, that, that just terrible. Think of something else. So we came up with the palace variant on the iron paradigm. One thing that we learnt was that in laboratory rats, adult rats, once the kids are weaned, once they stop suckling with the mother, the mother and every other adult in the, in the colony is just not interested in kids. They don't want anything to do with them. So the kids usually go and hang out with other kids. And so we concluded that if we put an adult with a juvenile, that juvenile would get very little opportunity to play. Whereas if we put the juvenile with another juvenile, that juvenile will get a lot more opportunity to engage in pay. Both of them will get other social experiences, like you've got somebody living with you, you groom one another, you sleep with one another, you can follow each other around, you can smell each other. But this little guy, uh, these were girls, this little girl would not get much in the way of play, that other little girl would get more play. Now, this is another little thing that one learns in a career in science, and we were just talking about this before this started, is that sometimes you do things and it just turned out to be bloody lucky you did because you get an answer that you did not anticipate that you would be looking for. So I was trying to be clever, and I said to my student who was going to do this experiment, well, look, if these juvenile, juvenile pairs are going to get more play, if we have another condition where we have a juvenile housed with three other juveniles, they'll get oodles of play. Because what we found out is that when you get multiple animals together, and probably most of the parents know this, if you've got two kids in the room, you get a certain level of noise, you get four kids, and it becomes way more raucous, not just proportional increase, it re really is a massive increase. And the rats do the same. So I said, why don't we add a third group? where we have a juvenile now raised with three other juveniles. They're going to get uber play, right? And if they get uber play, then we should magnify the effects on the brain that we see in the, the, guy, the girls with just one partner. My student at the time, Heather Bell, she looked at me quite darkly because there's 12 animals in each condition so that's 12 sets of brains that should have to slice and dice and count. So I just increased her workload quite a lot. So she wasn't happy with me, but at the time she was a master's student and she did what she was told. <laughs> she then went on to do a PhD with me and she told me, I'm not doing what you're telling me, this is what I want to do. If you want to do it, you want to help me with it, fine, otherwise I'm going somewhere else. So things do change when you make the transition, guys. So now we can look at, well, what happens to the, to the brain, the prefrontal cortex? Well, the first thing we found was that peer-peer play had the effect of pruning the complexity of the medial prefrontal neurons. Now, one of the things that happen in development, during fetal development and in rats, which tend to be born at a more immature stage than, than humans, it continues into the first few days after birth, is that you get this massive proliferation of cells and complexity in those cells. And then what happens is that as you experience certain kinds of interactions with the world, the number of cells and the complexity of the cells will generally be pruned down to their appropriate um, complexity to do the job they're supposed to do. But some systems in the brain, the opposite happens. The experiences protect those cell numbers and those, the complexity, and so maintains that complex structure. So for the medial prefrontal cortex, we found that peer-peer play had the effect of pruning the complexity of the medial prefrontal cortex. And I was wrong. It didn't matter how many peers you grew up with. It had the same effect. It was about an 18 to 20 percent effect and that's the same whether I've just got one partner in my room or a whole room, a whole table full of partners in my, in my cage. It doesn't make a difference. However, and this is where the serendipity comes in, because what we discovered was that play had no effect on the orbital frontal cortex. But what it did affect was that if you were 
in a room in a cage with multiple partners, it preserved the complexity of the orbital frontal cortex. So that means, and it didn't matter where. So this again, Heather was really dark on me that after we got these results because she had to rerun the experiment, but now run. <coughs> Um, a juvenile rat with three adults and a juvenile rat with one adult. And what we found is it's not the play that's influencing the, the preservation of the complexity of the orbital frontal, but it's how many people you got to interact with. And excuse me, I'm going to start calling rats people because I've been working on them so long, they are people to me. And we know these results are robust because Heather did it twice and then after she finished, I got another graduate student and Brian and I brought him through this process and he repeated the experiment twice and we keep on getting the same results. I'm pretty confident that these things are real robust effects. So social experience, play and interacting with a diverse number of other partners has these differential effects on these two areas of the co prefrontal cortex. Now one of the things again you can do with rats that you would not let me do with your children is that we can ask well, but what are these areas of the brain actually doing? And how can we find out? Well, what we can do with a rat is we can have rats that have been reared with other animals so that we know they've got normal social experiences growing up and then call on Brian to come in and either suck out that medial prefrontal cortex or leave the medial prefrontal cortex intact and suck out the orbital frontal cortex and then ask the question, well, what can they do and what can't they do when they're missing these bits of the prefrontal cortex? And we got two different effects. Removing the medial prefrontal cortex led to rats that were just terrible at coordinating their behavior with peers, with other rats. Say, so you, you do this when they're young adults, okay? So, I've picked on you, I've picked on you, so maybe I'll pick on you. So, th this is what I mean by social coordinate. Can you stand up a minute? Thanks. Can I get a shorter person, please? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, now, if he wants to punch me in the jaw, right? Pretend to punch me, don't, don't. <laughs> right? So, start punching, start coming. Now, if I wait too long before I duck, he's going to land that punch, yeah. right? If, on the other hand, before he starts, and then just as he starts, I duck, well, he can see me ducking, so he's going to change the direction of his punch and deck me out again. So in order to be effective, I have to judge it just right. Duck just at the moment when he's committed to the punch, and it's hard for him to change the direction, the trajectory, but not too soon or too late. Okay, that timing. Thank you. You're a good puncher. <laughs> that timing is absolutely crucial to coordinate your behavior with a social partner. And in the absence of the medial prefrontal cortex, your ability to coordinate is reduced. It's not absent, but it's reduced. And just in this, like in this example, you know, just being a little bit worse is really terrible. <laughs> with the orbital frontal cortex, what we saw is that removing the orbital frontal cortex doesn't impair your ability to coordinate your behavior with another animal, but what it does is it impairs your ability to modify what you do depending on the identity of the partner. Okay? Now we all live in in social networks where there's you have all kinds of relationships in the workplace. There are some people that are your boss and you're not, right? And so, for example, Exactly the same behavior. Somebody busts into my office. I turn around to see who it is. And it's my junior most colleague. And that person looks at me and says, you're an asshole. <laughs> well, my reaction is going to be, get out of my office. I don't want to hear this. Simple. If I turn around and that voice is booming from the dean, I'd go, what did I do? <laughs> right? You modify your behavior even for the same context, depending on the relationship you have with the social partner. So these two things are both essential to make you socially effective. And you can see why 
for the medial prefrontal uh, cortex, actually getting practice in maneuvers with a, with a peer helps you get that timing right. And you can see why with the orbital frontal, growing up with diverse social members gives you the opportunity to go, yeah, she, you know, what, I, what I can do with her, I can't do with her. And so you have to learn to modify what you do depending on your relationship. Okay. Now, now we can get to, well, but what exactly are the experiences that, are, that you get during play fighting that may actually improve the skill set? And now we're focusing more on the skill set from the medial prefrontal cortex. And again, we can go back to our friends here. And we can see, again, taking it from the point of view of the kid that got kicked in the back of the head, he, wa he clearly wasn't expecting this. Okay? And two things happened to him. One, he got hit in a way that he wasn't expecting. He lost control of his posture. He fell to the ground. And so one of the things that happens in play, and we get, we get to see this in our rats, Sometimes when our rats get really excited about playing, one jumps up at the other one, the other one rears up, and it gets pushed, and you can actually hear a thud on the ground. And you know, in a different context, if somebody threw you to the ground that hard, you'd be really ticked off, right? So what you're doing is, in this play, you're learning that a certain amount of uh, pain and a certain amount of loss of control is acceptable in certain social situations, but not others and you're making those judgments. The other thing you're, you're having to do here, and the kid, the kid on the ground there has to decide, is, is there something about little Johnny here that, you know, if this is the 10th time this week he's done that, maybe little Johnny is just taking advantage of me, and maybe I'm gonna change the way I interact with little Johnny tomorrow. Or, it's, I know little Johnny, he just gets so excited, he just can't help himself, so you tolerate it. So you've got this ambiguity that you have to decide on how to, how to deal with it. So one set of experiences you get in rough and tumble play is having to learn to deal with ambiguity and loss of control and some pain and figure out what the right level is for you to keep doing what you're doing or change what you're doing. The other thing that happens in rough and tumble play is, again, if go back to this drawing, remember that we started with one rat attacking the other, you go through a wrestle, and then at the bottom there, you get a roll reversal. And again, for those of you who are around my age, a bit older, maybe a little bit younger, you will remember that in a schoolyard when you're roughhousing with your friends, you know, there's got to be some turn-taking. If, if, if the kid you're playing with always wins, like, they're just not fun to play with. Alternatively, if you play with someone and you always win, like that's not fun either. There's got to be a right balance. And for rats, that balance is that somehow they're able to maintain about a 30% of their interactions like this lead to a role reversal. Too little, and one of them's going to get annoyed and not want to play anymore. So <coughs> being able to judge, what do you do? Now, what happens if... I just happen to have a partner who's bloody easy, right? I keep on getting the advantage and, I, and I'm keeping track, short-term memory, important prefrontal skill. I go, damn, I've just won 10 in a row. You know, my, my partner is going to get frustrated if I don't do something. And if we go to right to the middle panel, H, you see that configuration where one animal's flat on its back and the other animal's standing on top? Well, I'm going to magnify that for you and we look at the top panel, and you can see that the animal on top is able to keep its hind feet on the ground, uses its paws to track the other animal and keep, keep it from getting up. So I can counter move against the animal on the bottom, and I've got a nice stable base to do that. But sometimes, a rat does something that you go, well, you're an idiot. Look at the bottom panel. If you stand on the other animal with all four feet, you just lost your advantage. <laughs> and, and we measured it. The, the rat on the bottom is more likely to produce a roll reversal if the rat on top stands on top with all fours than with just the forearms. And in fact, this standing on top behavior is more likely to occur during that 
peak play period, 30 to 40 days. That is, the animals are really sensitive to making sure that they're altering their behaviour appropriately so that they can maintain a properly balanced uh, turn-taking interaction with one another. So again, that takes, essentially, what it, whatever fairness means to a rat, it's somebody not winning too much beyond 30%. <laughs> and so, in order to do that, you've got a turn-take, which means you've got to monitor the situation, you've got to monitor what you're doing, what your partner's doing, and then add some weird movements in order to redress if there's an imbalance. Uh, I'll get rid of that. Okay, so what, what do we think play, play fighting does? Well, the first thing I think it does is it, imp it improves the brain mechanisms that are involved in social skills. And there's a nice piece of research that's been done on human children that shows that, hey, you can actually improve prefrontal executive function skills in children by doing the following. And this work has been done for the last 15, 20 years by Adele Diamond from the University of British Columbia. And what she did was she developed this program. I, I, need, I need somebody else. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to get this. I'll give it back to you. See this sheet of paper? So the kind of thing she does is she gets kids, four to six years of age, come into a program, and for a span of a couple of months, she gives them this training experience. So at the beginning, she tests them for age-appropriate executive function skills, gets a baseline measure, and then puts them through the following program. You two. Here is a sheet of paper. You're four and six, right? <laughs> Here's a sheet of paper. Here's some pencils. Here's some crayons. What I want you to do is draw something. And then me, the adult, I get out of here. Right? I'm gone. Then... They're left on their own devices to do the following. Well, what are we going to draw? You have to negotiate. Who's going to sketch it out once they decide what they're going to draw? A boat, a house, what? Then they have to negotiate, well, who's going to sketch it out? Who's going to colour it in? Do we take turns? Or do, do I draw and you sketch and you fill in the colours? How do we do this? They set up the rules. And then this is going to go on for some period of time. And what happens if one of them cheats? They decide, no, I'm not going to give you the crayons. I want to keep, draw, I want to keep filling in the colours. Then what does the other one do? Again, this negotiation process goes on. And what Adele Diamond found was that after about eight weeks of doing this, when you look at the prefrontal function again, the executive functions, they're much better. So engaging in this social play where you're negotiating together freely by yourselves, not under adult supervision, you actually use and improve those executive function skills. So rats are like people. Or no, people are like rats. <laughs> <laughs> but then you can ask, and I should probably finish in about five minutes, then you can ask, okay, I buy it. You, you have rats or kids play freely with one another and they improve their social skills. But who cares? I want my kid to be a straight A math student so they can get into Harvard. Right? And rough housing is not going to do anything good for that. Well, let me show you some evidence to suggest that's not the case. It turns out that social skills are very important for the educational process. One of my, and again, there's lots of studies, but one of my favourites is this one. They looked at kids at third grade and they measured two things. The social skills the kids have and their educational performance. Then five years later in grade eight, they looked at the same kids and they asked the question, what better predicts eighth grade ed educational achievement? Is it social skills or is it educational achievement at third grade? And it turns out social skills have a bigger impact. So social skills are really critical. I'm nearly done, Craig. 
his pacing. Got me worried. Also, there are studies showing that kids that engage in free play with one another actually develop better um, language skills. I won't show you the data. I won't show you that. So I'll try to just wrap this up. So what does it buy you? Well, you can think, if you think about it, if you've got good social skills and you're in a classroom with your peers, you have your little breaks and you can chat with people and then get back to work, you feel pretty much like you belong there. However, if you've got really poor social skills and you're sitting in a classroom where you think everybody in the room hates your guts, you're not going to concentrate on, on schoolwork. You're going to feel miserable because we're very social animals. And if you don't feel like you belong to the group, you feel terrible. And if you feel terrible, you're not going to perform well in the educational setting. So let's draw some conclusions. So what I'm saying is that free play, including rough and tumble play, can facilitate the development of the prefrontal cortex and the executive functions that that area of the brain subserves. And that improved executive functions in childhood lead to better social skills, increased adjustment to school and other social settings, and overall better mental health. And critically, if you want your little kid to get to Harvard, it improves their academic achievement. And quite simply, as we saw that correlation that, that um, Pellegrini showed, that kids that play more seem to have a greater repertoire of social skill, uh, so social strategies to solve s social problems. Well, we're living in a world which is ever-changing. You're meeting all kinds of people. You're traveling around the world. You, you don't know where your next job's going to come from. There's all kinds of uncertainty in the world. And you're going to encounter unpredictable situations better executive function skills lead to better adaptability to unknown situations. So here's my prediction. Kids that play a lot as children, like the dean nearly killing his brother, <laughs> is going to lead to better adaptable outcomes. He's dean and I'm not. <laughs> so... <laughs> so... My advocacy for the night is that play is good and it should be encouraged in children because it has good long-term effects. Uh, just to acknowledge the fact that none of this could, could happen without having lots of talented, smart students working in the lab and having smart colleagues lying around who you can tease what's in their brains. And rats are getting more expensive to maintain every day, so I can't do this well, I could, I'd have to take another mortgage out, or you get a grant from a federal agency that can support your rats. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions. In our next episode, geography professor Dr. Maura Hanaran explores creating heroes and claiming the North, Captain Robert Abram Bartlett in the Arctic.